Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm here with Deacon Chris, and um, Deacon Chris and I were talking the other day about um, uh, marriage and life and the, the challenges of being um, uh, kind of stuck at home and quarantined during this time. And uh, Deacon Chris actually had an experience recently uh, uh, celebrating a, a, ma a marriage, a wedding with a couple. Um, and it kind of just uh, stirred up some, some thoughts in his own mind that, that were shared with a, a number of different staff members. We gave, began to talk a little bit about uh, marriage and um, what it means, especially during this time of, of quarantine. So uh, we thought it'd be uh, potentially uh, illuminating or, or uh, beneficial for us to have a little conversation to break open a little bit more what marriage is and um, maybe some tools and strategies that, that we can use um, to kind of help our marriages thrive during this, this time of quarantine. So Deacon Chris, thank you for uh, uh, initiating this conversation. I'm grateful uh, to to help and uh, really grateful to the couple that uh, I was able to witness their marriage. They specifically picked out a, a reading for their wedding that was um, very uh, significant in talking about the maturity of marriage. Uh, this couple has been married for a number of years and they have a child and uh and because of that, the maturity of their relationship really came through by the scripture that they chose. So that's great. You, you want to share that scripture with us and, and maybe read it so everybody kind of has a, a, a frame of reference? Yeah, I'd be happy to. This is one of the readings that can be chosen at weddings. It's not often chose, but uh, that's why it really stood out to me. And actually, uh, Vicki, our communications director, was there. She was taking some pictures. You might have seen those on the, on the last bulletin. And uh, she said, wow, that was very powerful, uh, especially with the intimacy of just having the couple and their, their, young, their young daughter. It's from the, Paul's letter to the Colossians. Because you are God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with heartfelt mercy, with kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, forgive whatever grievance you have against one another, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Over all these virtues, put on love, which binds the rest together and makes them perfect. Christ's peace must reign in your hearts, since as members of the one body, you have been called to that peace. Dedicate yourselves to thankfulness. Let the word of Christ, rich as it is, dwell in you, in wisdom made perfect. Instruct and admonish one another. Sing gratefully to God from your hearts in psalms, hymns, and inspired songs. Whatever you do, whatever in speech or in action, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Give thanks to God the Father through him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That's so rich with so many, uh, uh, well, the word virtue comes up in it, and it's one of the things that we use for couples that are either entering into the married uh, sacrament of matrimony, they're newly engaged, or couples who were simply married and now they come back to the church and they want their marriage to be made a sacrament, and, and um, there were people coming into the church, which is the last two couples. Uh, one of the spouses was, was actually coming into the church, so they, they actually do go through the marriage ceremony if they are married outside of the church, one of their spouses. But virtues is a part of what we use, or the program that we use, which is called Witness to Love, that helps couples develop that loving relationship with each other, that there are certain virtues in a marriage that you need to to have and to nurture, and uh, the ones that we, we use frequently are the ones that are mentioned here. Um, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Uh, and that comes up over and over again. How do, how do you live that life of marriage and, and developing those, those virtues? Yeah, and as you and I mentioned when we were first talking about this, you know, St. Paul wasn't really writing uniquely to married couples. He was writing to the church, to the Christian community, but it's it's so fitting that uh, these same virtues that, that he calls all Christians to, whenever really, whenever Christians are existing in community, um, that these are the virtues that ought to kind of set them apart. It's most fitting that, that these are present in the family, you know, the domestic church, right? The the, the, the home home base of, of, of where the church grows and is nourished. Um, so 
let's talk about these virtues a little bit more that you mentioned. Um, uh, what are these virtues? Um, maybe just kind of uh, defining them first so we have like, uh, an understanding of what they are, uh, and then we can kind of get into how we, how we can grow in these virtues. Uh, one of the ways, uh, and I, I can actually use this directly from our, uh, our marriage, marriage uh, program, uh, one of them is lovingness, being loving to one another. And lovingness is de defined as you recognize the preciousness of your beloved, cherishing, cherishing him or her, doing all you can to protect, nourish, and strengthen your bond. You possess an other-centered disposition. And it also says what those things, what it cannot be is one of the, one of the, uh, the, the opposites or different um, uh, degrees of that could be smothering, which is one extreme, or failing to love. But being loving is that de definition, and then failing to love, which is, you know, you could probably imagine what those things are, is, is um, uh, but also smothering as well. So that's one of the virtues. Patience uh, is defined as far as in marriage prep or in marriage enrichment, which I think is really what we're talking about here more so. But we use this book for couples that have been married many years. Um, you have control over your temper under difficult circumstances, uh, like now, <laughs> and uh, and enduring uh, restlessness and annoyances without complaint or loss of temper or patience is a level of endurance of one's character that can be taken before becoming negative. And uh, I've always, uh, long, many years ago, a priest, and it's a common definition that patience is defined as long suffering. And yeah. so <laughs> being able to, when you pray for patience, remember that you're praying for long suffering. Yeah. Uh, but uh, how you uh, how you live that out, and obviously the being insensitive or impatience would be the extremes one way or another. And then the last one is forgiveness, and this is probably key to every relationship in marriage or just in day to day life. Forgiving is to maintain a peaceful posture in the world of real or perceived suffering, pain or hurt from another is likely to occur. Maintain this state can uh, help you respond peacefully, avoiding the natural tendency to strike back when hurt. Yeah, yeah, that's so, great. I, those those three virtues, even just just love, patience, and forgiveness. I mean, if um, th that's enough right there for a, a lifetime's worth worth of work and effort, you know. And um, yeah. I think what's what's beautiful about that is oftentimes these words I think don't necessarily. Uh, actually mean what we might think they mean in common usage, you know, like, like loving your spouse doesn't always mean that you feel warm and fuzzy about your spouse. Like, like love is one of my favorite definitions of uh, Pope Benedict is to love someone is to will that person's good, right? To the, the firm and constant will to willing the good of the other. Um, and so our love has far more to do with, with what we actively do for the other than our interior disposition. Now, hopefully we're doing things that are loving because we have this experience, this feeling of love, but whether that's there or not, whether they, like the reality is most of the time when my wife gets up in the middle of the night to feed our, our six month old, like she doesn't do that, do that because she feels this loving drive toward, it's, it's because it needs to be done, right? It's the good that needs to be done. And so out of love, she does the good that is necessary. Um, and so one of the insights from uh, Pope Francis that always struck me in his le recent encyclical on love in the family is he said that love doesn't have to be perfect for it to be valuable. And I thought that was really important for us to hear. Um, I think we have this tendency to think, well, I, I can't love because I do it so imperfectly. Well, better to do it imperfectly than not not at all, right? So so our, our even our, our best efforts, even though they might fail, those efforts are still, are, are still necessary. Many of the times when I'm talking to couples and about these or other issues that are that the way they they're approaching uh, their relationship is is to try and take them out of the realm of feelings and bring them into the realm of will mm -hmm. that, um, you know, you can't just love your spouse when you feel like you do, you know, like you want to love them. Yeah, uh, you can't be forgiving because you uh, feel like you want to be forgiving um, and you can't be patient just because it comes naturally. These are things that you have to 
really work on and nurture, and that's why they're called virtues, because they're, uh, the word virtue is a strength. It's, it's something that you build, it is a strength that you have, is what a virtue is defined as. But, and so um, they're like any skill that they, they need to be nurtured, they need, be, need to be practiced, but they're a conscious, you can't just expect uh, that it's going to come about naturally. You, it's something that definitely needs to be worked on. Yeah, it has to have effort. I mean, like you, in, because it's like any habit or any skill, um, the only way to get it is by doing it, right? You can never be a, a great golfer by watching golf on TV. Like you have to get out there and start sw- swinging some clubs, you know. And in the same way, you're never going to magically become patient other than by exercising patience. Um, and I think what's what's important to remember is is these virtues, especially patience and forgiveness. Um, we have a tendency to think that like forgiveness is saying, well, what you did, well, it's no big deal. It doesn't matter. It's okay. And that's not what it is at all. It might 100% not be okay, but forgiveness is saying ultimately, one, I'm not willing to um, to to allow my hurt, even if it's legitimate hurt, um, to then turn my will towards one of of malice, one of a desire for 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 you to be hurt as well. Um, and that takes that takes strength, that takes effort, that takes uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, but it, but it is it is possible. But the only way that really comes about is by uh, these small daily acts of forgiveness, these small daily acts of patience. Because, um, I mean, in my life as a, as a married man, so married with, with eight children, um, so here we are all uh, stuck in our um, our small house here during quarantine. Um, and it's given us a lot of great blessing for opportunities together. For example, like being home for every meal three times a day, you know, like that's a, been a great blessing for us as a family. But it's also the strain of us constantly being around one another. And in any marriage, I think it can be tempting to like start playing the like keeping score game. Like like I've I've emptied the dishwasher the last four times, and so therefore it's clearly your turn to do it this time. And then we start counting. Well, see, I've done this, this, and this. That's why I shouldn't do it. And they they can make that same count. And I think what's important for us to realize is whenever we play that game, everybody loses. Like because the reality is, I'm always as a husband going to do things that my wife doesn't see. Like do things out of love, do things that are of service to the family that she's maybe not going to see. And I know she does countless things that I never see. Um, and so I think the difference is uh, what you mentioned there um, being turned outward toward the other. And I yep. think whenever we try to keep score and think, well, I've done this and I'm entitled to this and I deserve this, um, perhaps. But let's look the other way. Let's look first to be loving rather than to be loved. Right. Let's look first to be patient rather than to have somebody else be patient with us. And and what's what's helped me is is recognizing uh, just how much potential I have for sin has has helped me become more patient with the shortcomings of others. The more I wear, aware I am of my shortcomings and my potential to be a jerk, <laughs> um, it's helped me become more patient with uh, with my family and especially with my spouse. The what you said and like, like it said here, um, lovingness is uh, possessing an other-centered disposition, so that I'm not going to empty the dishwasher because it's my turn, but because I want to do this for the good of the family, uh, because my spouse needs the time to rest, or or whatever. But whatever you do, looking at it um, not as an obligation, I think that's, you know, obligation over a gift and and doing it out of uh, a service to to whomever. It's your, your family, your one you know, you're one big unit, so it's not like you're just serving one person in the family. You know, the whole family benefits by one act of love. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, between you and your spouse or your children, you know, one act of love spreads far and wide. And uh, because it's not focused on what what am I getting out of it, but what am I giving? And then that 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 and then God m- multiplies that. Yeah, I think if we can remind ourselves daily that that marriage is a sacrament of service, if yes. that can be a constant framework, um, I think that's uh, it, it's so important for us. Um, and and we serve not because ultimately even we want to, we serve because there's a natural goodness in in serving. And and not that we seek like self-serving motives, but I mean the, the scripture actually says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And that is that is true, right? Like we were designed to make ourselves a gift for the other. And I, I always challenge people to think of like the most selfish person that they know um, and not, not naming any names, but like if you call to mind the most selfish person you know, I would guarantee that person isn't happy because selfishness isn't the way to happiness. Uh, and you think of some of the most generous people you know, they're probably also the most joy-filled people uh, that, that we know. And, and so I think that the more we can 
uh, keep that in mind always that marriage is a sacrament of service. And then for me, it comes down to putting that into action, like meaning how do I make small gestures of service um, uh, throughout my day? Because the reality is it's very easy for us to be selfish. We have a million opportunities to be to be selfish. Um, but we also have those same opportunities to like to be selfless, to put our own interests aside for the moment and to, to take a step toward, uh, toward serving the other. And, and it's the small things that train us to do the big things, right? We, again, like anything else, the way we're going to get to a point where we have a heart of service is by small daily acts of service, right? So the example that I always give, because, because it always comes to mind, like if I'm in the bathroom and I go to throw something into the wastebasket and it bounces off the rim and then bounces off, right? Like, it's so easy for me to be like, Eh, somebody will get it later, right? And by somebody will get it later, I mean my wife will get it later when she when she sees it, you know? And like such a small thing, but if I can't make that small little sacrifice of like doing this thing uh, so that somebody else doesn't have to, how am I ever going to make the larger sacrifices? Uh, so for me, it comes back to like, like you said, like this training and a skill. The only way to get there is by doing it. And that's one of the things that this, this program that we use it in, in like in this one exercise, this is called, uh, uh, what does friendship have to do with marriage? And so that's, I always laugh at that. It's like, and some couples don't realize it. it's like, you know, uh, you're marrying your best friend, or at least that's that's kind of the goal because that um, that loyalty and that commitment to a friend sometimes can uh, um, have a depth to it that even married couples don't necessarily, if they're not friends, if they don't have this friend relationship where they have a, a loyalty to one another. As as friends, if that's missing, uh, it can it can um, uh, make a marriage shallow. Uh, you know that's the best de definition. But uh, for our couples that are listening to this today, you know to to pick one of these virtues, like either loving, patient, or forgive me, and and just evaluate yourself. You know, put yourself on a scale one to ten, where you think you are. Uh, don't ask your spouse because then that, that causes problems. <laughs> Just keep it to yourself and pick one of those virtues and say, you know, I want to learn how to become a more patient person in my relationship with my family, my spouse, you know, or, you know, and it does spread out. And then uh, set yourself a goal, say, for the next month that, uh, you know, I'm going to, you know, and, and this is, these are completely individual. You only know how, how this affects you. And make yourself uh, some goals throughout the week, and then evaluate yourself. And then at the end of the month, you know you can share this with your spouse if you want to do this, uh, you know, as as a couple. Uh, let them pick a virtue that they want to work on. Maybe you know they're the same, whatever. But uh, give yourself some uh, little goals that you can attain every day. How am I going to wake up today and be a more patient person, not for the rest of my life, but just today? You know, for the next 10 minutes, mm -hmm. uh, the, the next person I run into, how am I going to be patient to them instead of just, you know, thinking about what I'm going to do next, actually listening to them? That's a great gift of self and patience. So uh, uh, that, that's one thing I, I can recommend, uh, you know, for each of us. I mean, these are, like you said, Paul didn't write this just for married couples. He, 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 he wrote this letter for the whole church. So, yes, I can learn how to be a more loving, patient, and, and forgiving person. And the way we do that is through, through prayer and through practice uh, every day. Yeah. And I think you hit a, an important key there is that uh, ultimately – We've got to take the time to to pray, to reflect, and to to examine our own minds and our own hearts and our own right. conscience, and not do that for our spouse because that becomes a very dangerous game. Um, and you know, even with uh, sacramental preparation for our kids, they always tell us, "Don't examine your kids' conscience for them. Like, allow them and enable them to do that for themselves." And I think that's true. Uh, like, uh, ultimately, if I if I take the time to be honest with myself, if I take the time for prayer and reflection. God will show me the areas of, of growth. He will show me the blind spots in, in my love. Um, and so what I need to be is, is I need to become a better husband. I don't need to tell my wife how to become a better wife, right? If I become the best husband I can be, ultimately that becomes, um, it, it pushes each other on. I remember reading a book by Fulton Sheen a long time ago that he said, part of the beautiful thing about love is that people have a desire to be what the other sees in them. Right. And so when I, when, when my life, when my wife loves me, despite all my failings, it makes me want to be better. Right. It, it makes me want to be the man that she holds me up to be because I know myself and all my, my failings. Um, and so I think the more that we can take those, those daily steps for our own striving, for our own growth, um, that will in fact 
uh, spur each other on uh, uh, forward. Um, and I, I think that there's um, there's there's it has to be like this ability I think to um, know when to when to act and speak up and address something and when to al- allow it to just go. Uh, meaning like not not every conflict has to become an explosive conflict. Not every conflict needs to needs to be addressed even. But at the same time, if it's if it's something that you're willing to let go then let it go and truly let it go, right? Like, don't just like put it in my, oh, I'm just gonna put this in my pocket and pull this out six months from now when things really hit the fan. Um, and so there has to be like this, if it's an issue, then address it and work through it as an issue. If it's something though that doesn't need all that, then just love. Like the answer is just love and forgive. Mother Teresa's answer for everything was always just love and forgive, love and forgive. Um, and so I think that that's important. So th- so obviously there's there's might be issues and things that have to be discussed in marriage and worked through. But at the same time, um, it might just be that I just need to shut up and I might not need to just not say something. And, and just because I could respond this way and I have this zinger that I'm ready for, like, and I know I'm going to win the argument with this. And, and let's be honest, everybody loves to win arguments, right? I remember <laughs> people, people will say like, oh, you, you think you're always right. And I'm thinking, of course, everybody always thinks they're right, right? No one like says something and says, yeah, but I'm probably totally wrong on this, right? Um, and so I have to remember that also, always that like, I don't, I don't have to be right, even though I love being right. I don't have to be right all the time. Um, and that's that's like a, a, a you're, short you're not, coming. By the way, I just let you, you know, Well, whatever, whatever, we'll argue about that later. <laughs> um, but again, like this idea of just like, sometimes what is needed is for me to do nothing. Sometimes what is needed is for me to just shut my mouth and love anyway. Um, yeah. And again, that's because what my wife and my family is going to see is how I live toward them, not not what I think in my mind about about a situation. You know, two two things that you said uh, that came to mind. Uh, uh, many of the people may be listening to this new father Marcel, and he gave me and my wife a piece of wisdom uh, many many years ago. He says, "Everything you say must be true." But not everything must be said. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so, you know, that and that requires wisdom and prudence and judgment to, to how, you know, yes, I might have the truth, but is this the time? Is mm-hmm. this person ready? Or do, you know, what's the purpose of this? Is it to be right? Or right. is it to, you know, to help? the? But also what you said about children uh, modeling uh, or preparing children for sacramental preparation. But um, I, I tell every couple that, you know, oh, it's wonderful you've been engaged now for, you know, for three weeks, uh, but truthfully, you've been marriage preparation for your whole life. Mm-hmm. Uh, no matter what kind of family you grew up in, whether it was a, you know, single parent or intact family, a divorced family, everything you know about marriage, you've learned from the, you know, from the family that you came from. And likewise, you know, our couples who are parents, they're blessed with children, they're watching you, you know, as you well know, and every way that you interact, and they're learning how to navigate life and marriage through the lessons they learn from you. And uh, that, that that's a great responsibility. Uh, in baptismal prep, when I help couples with that, it's like, you know, you're taking on the responsibility of this soul to learn how to live life as God taught us to love God and love our neighbor by the way you, and not by what you tell them, but the actions that you have. And so, and that's all done within, you know, in our context of a marriage and a family. So um, yeah, being able to show your child how to be patient uh, by the way you show patience to your spouse. Right. And I think even, even the showing them the the primacy of that relationship that um, like my kids know that I, I, I was joking with my kids like, yeah, I love mom more than you guys. Like, yeah, I love, but I love more. And I'm like, it's not even close. You guys, just so you know, like I love her way, way more. Now yeah. that doesn't mean, yeah, I said that jokingly and, and they, uh, my kids know that I love them and, and, um, uh, and I do love my kids tremendously, obviously, but um, it's the best gift I can give to my children is, the strength of the relationship that I have with my wife is, sure. is the again, the witness of, of the love that we have. And I, I think it's very tempting for parents to, once they have kids, to just switch their brain into parent mode. And like, I'm a parent now, and they forget about the importance and the primacy of that of that relationship. Um, so I think, again, that's, um, 
and, and that's some of that's natural, just kind of the byproducts of, of the busyness of life and family life and things like that. You get suck, sucked into those responsibilities. It's easy to forget the, the, the uniqueness and the primacy of that first relationship. Um, yeah. yeah, part of that is encouraging couples, you know, all couples married and, and, and engaged is like, you know, remember this this marriage that you're forming right now has to be uh, the center of your relationship. Everything else outside or everything else in the world has to stay outside, whether it's work, finances, you know, all the things of the world have to stay out of the sanctity of this marriage that you're that God is bringing you together in. And that includes your children. Your children can't uh, in, in, encroach or, or overtake this marriage because, as I, I tell couples, it's like, you know, uh, hopefully in 20, 25 years, they're going to leave. <laughs> Not really, right? And uh, then you're going to wake up with your spouse one day and look at them, and hopefully they're not a stranger. You know, there's somebody that, you know, you've you've lived this whole life with, and look what the fruit of that is, is the family and friends that, you know, that have been produced from it. But um, at the end of the day, it's going to be the two of you, and, and you have to keep that uh, in the center for yourselves, but also, as you said, for your family. They will learn great, great benefits to that. So how do we do that? Um, I've been giving a book to couples recently. I came across this uh, by, it's a Dr. Fitz. Fitzgibbons, he's from Colorado. It's been, uh, if you read the credits and the people that have endorsed this book, uh, it's, yeah, Habits for a Healthy Marriage, a Handbook for Catholic Couples. And awesome. it covers the, the gamut of, of relationships. It's relatively new, but uh, even the first, first couple chapters in it are, uh, uh, let's see, Forgiveness. Habits for a Healthy Marriage, uh, How to uh, Reduce Anger, uh, how, to over, how to Conquer Selfishness, and the last one, I, uh, Respect, and Respect Overcomes, I like this, Respect Overcomes the Urge to Control. Mm -hmm. that's good yeah and, and uh yeah that, that's an interesting point you know i remember um uh my wife and i when we first started having kids and um uh my wife works as a, as a nurse so she would she'd be away two days a week and um she was always very intentional uh and, and we obviously talked about this but like um to not like pick the kids clothes before she goes to work and like get their meals ready for them she's like no, no no like you need to be not only responsible for parenting the child while i'm gone but empowered to do so right so like if i get the kids dressed and they don't match and look cute who cares right like that dad's the one who's who's caring for them today and and my wife gave me the power and the freedom and the authority to kind of do that um and to to and i think it was because it was a sign of respect right that that right. she didn't she tr ultimately she trusted me to care for the kids and but our kids know that I'm going to do things a little bit differently when dad's home versus when mom's home. I mean, ideologically we're on the same page in terms of boundaries and rules and those things, but like, um, there's, but, but that's just part of the different dynamics of relationships. There's things that annoy me that don't annoy my wife. And there's things that annoy my wife that don't annoy me. And, and, um, but I think that's the key there is, is when we really respect the other, we, we give them the freedom and the power to, um, to kind of, uh, to, to, to live out their vocation, um, in their own particular way. And see their own dignity, which mm -hmm. was given by God, which is your gift. That is the gift that God gave you in your spouse, is this yeah. wonderful human being that has all these um, these other gifts that, yeah. that you get the opportunity to uh, to share and to grow and to uh, to just uh, partake in. And that, that, that is a beautiful aspect of marriage. Now, in all this, I mean, obviously, this sounds like this is great. Marriage is good and it's beautiful and wonderful. I love it. But at the, at the same time, we have to acknowledge the fact that, that marriage is still a struggle. It's, it, it's, it's work. It's a yeah. challenge. And one of the things that I, I remember gave me great consolation and, and was very insightful. Um, the catechism says that, that because of sin, marriage is now harder than it was intended to be. Yes. Right? Because of sin, marriage is harder than God actually intended 
affected me from the beginning. And the reason it's harder is because sin has has turned me inward. It's it's made me more selfish and more self-seeking. And because of that, marriage is harder. Why is marriage harder? Because marriage requires me to turn outward towards the other. It requires me to offer myself as, as a gift to the others. But then the catechism goes on to say that embedded in the very difficulties of marriage is a remedy for sin. Meaning that if we fight the fight of, of, of living marriage well, by doing so, that's going to call, call, uh, pull us right out of the very sinfulness that, that makes our life a battle, right? So, so the more I, I become selfless, the more disposed I am to overcome my selfishness, right? And so to the extent that we really step up to the plate to the demands of marriage, that will actually not only be good for our marriage, it's good for me as a person growing in holiness and in virtue, right? So embedded in the very difficulties of, of marriage are a remedy for our fallenness and a remedy for our sinfulness. I thought that was very beautiful. Yeah, and Dr. Scott Hahn said, uh, God gave us marriage to help grow us up as his children and then gave us children to finish the job. <laughs> and, and in that, it's it's always taking us out of ourself. You know, um, another definition for sin is addiction, or, you know, the two can be interchanged. That um, Because it, it, addiction and sin turns us, as you said, into ourselves. What we want, what is in it, in it for us. Yeah. And um, the true definition of love is being other-centered. What uh, For the, the sacrifice of self for the good of the other. Yeah. sacrifice itself for the good of the other. And so as we do that, we we take ourselves out of ourselves and, and then, as you said, take ourselves out of that uh, concupiscence or that, that tendency to sin. So to wrap up our video here, so what what, what would you recommend? What, what advice or uh, uh, kind of activities or, or something could you recommend maybe to help couples during this time, specifically uh, this time of, of quarantine, this time of, of uh, being outside of our normal routine? Uh, I would say on an individual level, maybe work on one of those virtues, uh, lovingness, virtue, and forgiveness. But also I, I have uh, suggested, especially for couples, because some of them, uh, you know, uh, thanks be to God, some of our couples aren't living together. Uh, and uh, to use something that, um, that has been used in our church for a number of years uh, through marriage encounter is dialoguing. Um, because when you when you share that uh, intimacy of yourself and you write it as a letter and it's a gift, whether it's a, a compliment or whether it's resolving a conflict or something, uh, it gives you that opportunity of time to to uh, to think it out, to write it out, and then to present it, and then your 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 spouse can receive it, and then it gives you the opportunity to share one another. Um, that, that I think, you know, would be helpful as the pressure gets, you know, built and hopefully they'll start letting us out a little bit more here soon. Um, th that, uh, that, that gift of dialoguing would be very helpful as well for couples. Yeah, I think that's huge. I think a lot of couples are finding themselves maybe with more time together than they're used to. Um, and maybe honestly more time together than they <laughs> normally would desire. Um, and I think we have to be kind of honestly be open to that possibility. Um, but well, to, to give them, uh, to, to work for that quality time. And I think quality time we tend to think is like productive time, but it doesn't necessarily be productive time. It's just time with the other. And I think listening to the other and the interests of the other, and even if you don't care, like it's, it's still this, this, again, this firming of the dignity of the other that I see you as a unique individual with your own interests and your own, uh, kind of, uh, hobbies and things like that, and and engaging in that, um, supporting that to the extent that it, the extent that you can. Um, but I, I think more opportunities for, as you mentioned, for for dialogue, for actual like um, uh, communication, and communication that's more than just you know um, how was work today and and how are the kids doing today, but but just about how are you doing and what are you thinking about and th those types of things. I I don't know. I, Another thing, because we have time um, that might be beneficial for couples, if they've never done it especially, is to um, to explore the the five love languages. Um, yes. I know that Absolutely. when I when I was getting married in the church, we that wasn't a part of our marriage preparation at the time for whatever reason. It, it wasn't included in it. And so um, I had been familiar with the, the process, but I had never actually done it until probably like five or so years ago. And at that point, I was already a decade into into marriage. And I found it to be so illuminating, not because it, it ultimately told me anything new about myself. 
it just affirmed why I do the things that I do or don't do the things that I do. Like it, it was, it was uh, very illuminating. So there's, there's online ways to do this that I think are even free um, where you can go and, and uh, kind of take like this survey individually to find out what your love language is. And I, I think as a couple, okay. it's extremely beneficial to know both what yours is and your spouse is because what can happen is I can be investing all this energy in loving in this way and it's, it's not being re- received and it's not because of deficiency in me. It's just, because people are made differently and we're wired differently and, and we experience uh, life differently. So that would be something I would recommend also if couples Absolutely. do. Yeah. Yeah. We give uh, uh, either at our parish or even downtown when the couples uh, attend some of the seminars, they're given that book, the five Lang- love languages. And uh, there's a new one called the five languages of forgiveness too, that I just heard about uh, just last year. So uh, that's a, the, another one that would be would helpful. But, yeah, it's, it's very frustrating when you've been doing all these acts of service for your spouse for all these years, which was my way of sharing. This is how I told my, my wife how I loved her, and she said, that's not my language. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just want time, just yeah, time yeah. together. And, you know, and, and so you, you need to, uh, you know, why isn't this working? Because – speaking greek <laughs> and she doesn't understand greek and so yeah it, it, it's 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 helpful to learn that yeah, yeah. Well, awesome digging this thank you so much and for you guys who are uh, listening you know know that that we as a church we're praying for you and that we're we're in this together um we we speak of these things not because we've mastered them um so so what we call you onto, we call ourselves onto also and uh just just keep at it because the the, the effort is worth it, right? The the end goal of, of a life of holiness and building up of the, the sanctity of, of marriage and the family, it, it's worth it. Um, and uh, so if you aren't praying already you're, as an individual, take time for prayer, ask God to show you those blind spots and he will. Um, and to the extent that you're capable and comfortable, make small steps of, of praying together with your spouse, praying together as a family also, because it's ultimately if, if we're turning to the Lord in prayer and listening to God, he will lead us. He will guide us. He's got this. Yeah, this time that we have right now isn't wasted if we don't waste it. If we use it and actually um, listen to what God is 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 trying to tell us during during this opportunity of of uh, uh, turning off the world, you know, mm-hmm. to some degree or another. It's like you know, and, and looking uh, at at ourselves and uh, the gifts that He's given us in our lives. And especially in our church, so we're we're so grateful, and um, we're all looking forward to the day when we can you know, celebrate mass together as a community. Uh, uh, the the church is so uh, it 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 I know it it aches the hearts of our priests, and and for everyone there when you know we we can be there and celebrate the mass, but you know we miss you so much, so very very much. Awesome. Well, thank you, Deacon Chris, very much for your time, and thank you for those who are listening. God bless you. God bless you.